Welcome back, everyone, to the Flying Lion Podcast. I am here tonight with a man that just got back from Peru. He's rocking an awesome jersey tonight. Zach, how we doing? And uh, give me a little bit of background on this jersey. It looks pretty cool. Oh, yeah, Peru was wonderful. I mean, Machu Picchu, can't go wrong. Pictures don't do it justice. But I did come back with this awesome souvenir, the uh, Cienciano Club. Uh, they're actually third place right now in the um, – Liga Una, I guess you want to call it, but actually I didn't know this. They won uh, Copa Sud America in 2003. Really? They beat, they're the only Peruvian team to um, have won the Copa Sud America and they beat River Plate. That was a, a surprising fact and stat that I found, but I actually got this through um, our, our tour guide. We had a bodyguard. His name yeah. was Santos. And this Santos guy was streaming a match while we were, we were at like an alpaca farm or something like that. Hmm. And I was like, Santos, what you watching? I'm like, Hey, is this your club? Like, are they good? Like I just started talking to him and he's like, Oh yeah. And then he was, he was, I was like, you have any hits? Cause he owns his own store within, in the like city, closer to the city. And wow. I asked him if he had any um, jerseys and he's like, Oh yeah, I'll actually sell you one. I'll bring it to dinner ne like next day or whatever. Wow. So I ended up uh, getting a Jersey from him and, rest is history i think zach is uh termed the the kit man for the flying lion i mean he's got like the best kits every single time we have an episode i'm just excited to see what you're rocking did you get to play in the uniform or in the kit while you were down there no but i did get a chance and um i was caliente is this small town pretty much base camp for machu picchu um got to play in this awesome like pitch in the middle of the town like all the like um, houses surrounded it. It was, it was amazing. It was picture perfect, beautiful mountains surrounding. Couldn't have been more perfect, honestly. You get to come back to uh, good old Cincinnati and uh, our seven Hills after that, but, uh, <laughs> but welcome back again, you know, tonight, um, for this episode, we're going to chat a little bit about a match recap, um, you know, match day five against NYCFC. We get a nice one Oh win. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the ref situation going on. We have another trivia question for you guys. Second half of the episode, we got card of the week, jersey swap of the week, and then we're actually going to get into a little bit of the UN's, U.S. men's national team. Um, we don't typically do that, but they had some good games over the weekend, um, so we'll chat on that a little bit here too. But going into our uh, match recap, again, for match day number five, uh, FC Cincinnati, you know, their, their record was 2-0-2. Um, and they get a 1-0 win. It was a uh, interesting, I guess, atmosphere, you know, Finally, Zach, it's a Saturday night game. We're super pumped about it. You know, we joined the March. Um, a lot of good energy, honestly, for how cold it was, but um, still just ready for some warm weather. Holy smokes. Yes. I um, will touch on a little bit more later, but yeah, I come back from a, I mean, pretty nice trip from Peru. And then I come home to expecting the um, spring to, to, you know, come. Cause I saw all the beautiful weather while I was gone and then come home to a freezing cold 30 degree um, match. And it's like, I thought that I was bundled, but you know, you've got, to, you've got to wear multiple layers, heavy coat, hat gloves at the full nine yards. I mean, it's, it was cold marching in, in with the, uh, the group. I, you, you can't clap because you're wearing gloves. Like, like we said, we always need to bring our little symbols with our gloves, you know? Um, That's a great idea. We've talked about that before in the games, but we need to make that a thing because how loud would TQL be, especially in the like colder games, if we had, like you said, symbols, you know, in the gloves or on the gloves, um, just some way to like create more noise and just create more of an intimate, uh, you know, atmosphere. But yeah, I mean, it was interesting. I mean, throughout the day, you're seeing so many people kind of either buying tickets or selling tickets because of how cold it was. Um, but hey, I mean, I'm happy about a win. So we'll kind of get into that part of things. The lineup, Zach, um, was pretty much what I thought it would be. Salentano, Oriano, Murphy, Miazga, and Keller. You have Yedlin, Buka, Kubo, Acosta, Baird, and Bupenza. So, you know, still with OB being out. Um, sounds like last Friday he was actually running around with some of the training uh, staff. So it looks like he's hopefully going to be maybe back for the next game, but playing on turf, we'll get to that later. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, Kubo slots in there and then you see because of, uh, Miles Robinson with being with the U S men's national team. Um, so you get Kip Keller that slots in honestly pretty well and should have even had a goal. Um, so pretty excited about the lineup and how kind of the game started. Yeah. I, I thought the, just the big real change is the Kubo starting in the middle. Um, I mean, he's been playing right wing back or yeah, right wing back. I, and he's been playing a bunch of positions, let's be honest, the past few matches. But um, I, it was really cool to see Buka and Kubo play play together in the midfield. I think um, offensively, I think we're more impressive with Kubo and uh, Buka as opposed to Obi and, and Buka. I mean, Obi, Buka, you got the deep, strong defense, strong offense. But with Kubo, um, you have that additional attacking presence right right um it, it's a lot it's a lot more choices you can, you can play with up top so i thought that was the the more standout um position that was uh starting in the lineup you see kind of the way that they line up too and you have uh you know baird is up there with acosta kind of like dueling tens or uh similar to what we did for the new england game so is this something that, you know, Pat's seeing? Is he trying to implement to strengths right now or get the offense going? Um, I think, you know, he makes his post-game comments. To start the game, that's kind of how they wanted to come out, and that's what they saw with NYCFC and how they wanted to press. They wanted to have Lucho and Baird be able to kind of go to the center backs on each side with Bupenza in the center. Towards the second half, just the way the, the game went, we kind of went away from that a little bit. But there's this interplay between those front three where – Acosta can now play up a little bit more. Baird plays back a little bit more as like an attacking mid type player. So there's a lot of transition in those positions, um, which I, I honestly, I don't mind, but to your point, yeah. I mean, you see Kubo kind of slot in and can add more to the attack can dribble kind of take on people too. Um, I would love, you know, in this game, we saw Buka just being solid, a lot of energy as well. So he did really really well with that. Um, Zach, the first moment that I kind of point out was uh, in the eighth minute. I just want to kind of real briefly touch on how beautiful of a turn, number one, it was for Oriano to leave this guy behind. You know, he kind of does a dummy and then lets the ball go through. He whips a left-footed cross right onto the foot of uh, Bupenza, who just puts it right at the keeper. Like, I think one of maybe three one-on-one -on -one opportunities we had in the match, but the first one in the eighth minute where, you know, you take the game by the horns at that point, if you score and you can dictate how you want to play. Um, but we don't get a goal there and uh, we keep building though, you know, and it comes down to the the 16th minute, um, which Zach, what did you see on that play? Uh, that, that play was the most frustrating play. I think all match, honestly, the um, with, with Bupenza, I mean, you see it a couple times, honestly, throughout this match as well. Um, him one on one, he always slows down, and his his choices are never the like right choice. Right, like it, he always does exactly what the goalkeeper expects him to do. Um, the the goalie, and I think I said this in the match, like he was on the ground before uh, Bupenza even had the ball. It seemed like so he was guessing way ahead of time and it all he needed to do was either chip it or switch over to his right foot and then put it around him on the right and it's just easy goal honestly i think he he should have put that in yeah i mean he's just got to do better with that it would like you said just be more decisive with it i i didn't really notice that he slows it down but now that you mention it i mean it makes sense he does really kind of just hesitate or maybe he's trying to get the ball on his left foot or correctly kind of, you know, right where he wants it, but he's got to be able to use right or left in that situation to find whatever, you know, you need to in that moment. Um, from that point on though, like I said, the 16th minute though, we have a corner that kind of gets headed out, uh, you know, from Lucho. Eventually it's played back to Lucho who plays a beautiful cross actually over to Kip Keller on the back post unbelievable celebration just slides down into the corner. Um, that's the first thing we noticed was just how cool his, his celebration was. Um, and then of course you can't celebrate in the MLS nowadays because there's always going to be a check or there's always going to be some look. So don't get your hopes up people. Um, yeah. So they go to VAR and honestly, going back and looking at it, Lucha was offside, but in the game, yeah. I don't think we got a replay like in the stadium. So it's tough for us to kind of say, 
what's going on. Like we were celebrating. Um, it seemed like they did go to VAR pretty quick, you know, after this happens. Um, and that was a reoccurring theme in this match, but um, it, it was just interesting, you know, how quickly things can get taken away. And you're thinking again, you're up one Oh, possibly in the eighth minute, you know, with boops, then you think you're one up with Keller in his header, you know, in the 16th minute and you get that taken away. So honestly, like props to them for not just folding over and just saying, you know, this game isn't going our way. Yeah. I, I, I wonder if this is a mental thing is, you know, is that boost their confidence or does that deflate them more? Like, yeah, I don't know. You go in, I mean, you score on, I mean, great goal by Kip and you got to feel good about it. Right. Obviously he was because he had an amazing celebration and, you know, they popped the smoke even, I believe. Like, I, I just don't get like, do, I guess in, in, you you have more experience playing, you know, so, like actual soccer, right? I, I just play pickup, so it's not the same. <laughs> but that counts. That counts. <laughs> do, does it boost your confidence or would that deflate you, you think? Depends on the player. I think as a team, collectively, you need a captain that says, you know, hey, we're not getting these moments, but we're creating them and we have to finish them now. Um, so from a captain's standpoint, I would say you have to just encourage everyone to keep going. From an individual player standpoint, Bupens is lacking confidence and he misses that goal. Or, you know, let's say he was the one that headed it instead of Keller. You know, I think it would just deflate him even more in some sense. But again, that's where you need your vocal guys to kind of pick you up where you need your coach that says, hey, you guys are creating these great opportunities, you know, keep going. Um, so, and especially, honestly, Zach, I wanted to just comment in the first half, you see, I mean, I think there's a total of 20-something fouls in that first half. So a lot of stoppage of play, a lot of, like, the ref bringing the ball back, you know, and we'll, again, talk about this in a little bit, but there just wasn't a good flow to the game because he just kept bringing it back. All right, throw the ball in back here and not up here. Oh, set the ball down. Oh, the ball's rolling a little bit, or it's not exactly where he wants it. And then Lucho gets a yellow, you know, because the player steps right in front of him. So there's a lot of frustrating moments in that half um, where, you know, again, we could have been up 2-0. I, I would have thought from the opportunities we had. Um, but you go into I, half 0-0. Zero, zero. Yeah, you're spot on. And I, I think really after that 14 or 16, 15, 14 to 16 minute, I don't remember when it was, that Kip Keller goal. After that, it was a very dull half. It seemed right. like we we were on the back foot. It some, seemed like most of the time, um, New York City, which it didn't feel like it in the um, the stadium when we were watching it, but they had full control. It looked like of the um, the match at that time, didn't they? But they did, but they didn't. I, that was the thing. Is like I felt like they had more possession and like just the game was played in the middle of the park, and yeah. there was a lot of times where. You know, you would just see uh, maybe a half chance here or there, but it wasn't like a definitive one. The one that stands out is right after half um, where the NYCFC guy somehow gets wide open in the box and Roman actually makes a decent save on it. So that that was really their chance that I thought that they had. But besides that, um, yeah, I mean, they have possession. I think at the end of the game, they get 55% of possession, but mm -hmm. or 54, I believe. But yeah, I mean... It just didn't feel like they were gonna like score though at any point, in my opinion. Like maybe right. they like Not felt threatening. like they had chances, but it wasn't like I ever felt like worried about it. Um right. and especially with you know Miles Robinson being out, you have Kip Keller that steps in and is winning every single head ball, you know, <laughs> possible, including the one that he, you know, you know, scores on, quote unquote. But um, you don't see a drop off. And I think for the back line, that's huge, especially with continuity with Roman too now. Um, what in the world was Austin seeing with Kip Keller, Zach? Like now we've seen him in what, four or five games and the dude's just been pretty solid. I mean, he has his moments, like Pat says on the ball where he can improve, but defensively, physically, um, he plays a, a solid game in the back. Yeah. I think, I mean, I mean, just, just to your comment on that 47 minute, that was Kip who was supposed to mark that guy. And he, all right, well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I should just yeah. say, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but no, there are moments where you see Kip, he's got really good. I mean, his his tackling and his actual defensive play is very good. But when he's got pressure on him, you can tell he's he's like Haglin from two, three years ago where he True. feels too pre like too much pressure and he like tries to get the ball away. Because you you can see it a little bit on some of the pass backs back to Roman. 
where it, it gets a little squirrely in my opinion. That's um, a good way to describe it. Yeah. It, yeah. And, but overall, like you, like you said, his, he dominates in the air, like, like nobody's business. He's a ha Haglin 2.0. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, I mean, great point, especially with the passing and kind of feeling like out of sorts in some moments, um, but a younger player. So if you can see that, and if you were able to kind of correct it with Haglin in some ways, can you now do it with Kip Keller too? Um, that's his one part of his game maybe that's lacking in some ways that um, if they can get that right or his passing, like we said, in um, moments over the top or creating opportunities through the midfield, then yeah, I mean, that it unlocks the team, which is which is huge. So um, moving on though, Zach, the, the big moment of the game comes in the 57th minute. Um, just a kind of a play really out of nowhere through the midfield where we play it um, up to, I believe, to Lucho. Lucho then plays it to Baird. He kind of does like a little bit of a dummy when the ball gets to Baird. Um, so he kind of faints on it, which allows the defender to get drawn out of position. Lucho kind of spins around. Baird plays him back in. Zach, I wanted to comment because I said it during the game. Uh, NYCFC's number 80. I forget exactly what oh, his yeah. name was. Um, do you, do you remember what his name was for? I, I, I really don't. Okay. I just know he's probably, uh, NYCFC two player. I think it Justin hack H A A K I believe, but number 80, right? So he comes into the game for their other center back and immediately you get Lucho that just cuts on him, you know, just this little faint cut and 80 just goes flying by like, welcome to the game. Um, but I, I, I told you, I said, let's take advantage of this back line, especially with this new guy coming in. And Lucho does that. I mean, he faints right around the guy, puts it in near post. I mean, how many times have we seen him just take the game on his back? And uh, a moment of brilliance from your MVP when you're struggling, you're frustrated. You have a yellow card maybe from a sticky situation. You know, a lot of fouls, a lot of VARs, a lot of just chaos. But the consistency is him finding ways to score. So you got to love it. Yeah. I mean, his off the ball movement, I, I can see why he would want to be playing as a striker sometimes right. when we are when we're lacking that, you know, right. word movement. So seeing him, I mean, that, that's a, that's a striker movement, just dumbing the ball straight through to Baird and then Baird just playing it. I mean, I think it was Bupenza speaking of. I think it was Bupenza who was passing it up to. Um, it might have been. Costa. Yeah. And, and it was yeah. a dummy through, through to Baird. So, I mean, overall, I think that, that was the, like you said, we need more of that kind of play, right? Well, like, and we need... like you said, it's striker play. So, I mean, we're going to yeah. touch on it here with the strikers in a second, I think. But, you know, what have I been saying all year long to you when you play with two strikers, how connected they have to be? And in that moment, you see Lucho kind of in a striker-esque moment do a little interchange with it or make a feint to make the defender get out of position. Um, that's what you got to do in that situation or in those positions. And I think if Bupenza and Baird can do that and say one goes after the ball, one's behind it, one's a flick on for you know a header, or one kind of plays a little bit higher, one's below it that can play off of them or get Lucho running through. I mean, that's where you can unlock defenses instead of being, you know, opposite sides of the field. And it's so easy to defend at that point. And, and maybe we should just move on to the PK because I just have more just ideas about it. But For really, sure. I mean, I think that the that attacking, you know, trio, they just need to be rotating constantly almost. Right. Like, too stagnant at times. What's that? It's too stagnant at times. Right, exactly. And, and I think if, if Lucho hops in into that like rotation with them, I think he'll really command that forward um, group to you know right. play more cohesive. Yeah. I mean, uh, leading to that, I mean, you're talking about the PK. So late on in the game, there's this call for a penalty kick, um, which comes through, I think, off of a – a ball that's played out and we kind of get a run um, down within the box. Lucha takes on like three guys and shoots it, deflects off the keeper, hits the guy in the arm. But it's like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do as a defender is how I would think for the NYCFC guy. Like, what am I supposed to do? The ball just deflected off my keeper. Um, so first glance, you're thinking like handball, like, all right, you know, but we still had the ball after that deflection. Um, so, you know, the ref goes and checks it. It says, actually, you know, 
I think the intercom, Zach, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but they say, you know, NYCFC ball is a handball on SC Cincinnati. And everyone's like, well, how did we hand the ball? I thought they handed the ball. I think the way it should have been worded that would have made the most sense is like there was a check for a handball. It yeah. was not ruled a handball and then they get the ball. But it seems unfair when you have the possession and you don't see that play out. You know, I think what have they been kind of trained to do in these situations, especially like offsides, is let the play go through see if there's a goal that's scored, then go back and check it. You know, you get that hand and we still have the ball, maybe a shot on goal, and then he stops it. And you don't even get that opportunity. Um, so, I mean, I, I was frustrated. It didn't really even feel like we were in the lead at that point. And then you get another one taken away. Um, man, I mean, I can't imagine how Lucho would have felt too. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, I'm not gonna lie, I feel like Lucho is a little confused on what what was even called in the first place. Yeah, he just stood there and waited for the ball. Yeah, and, and it, I think Oriana was um, a little frustrated just for the fact that he had the ball, like you said, after after the whistle and Dado or him, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember, but yeah, it's just a bizarre situation. And then us not getting the ball back after, like I, that was the bizarre part because I think it was a. Um, they thought it was a handball on the guy, like you said, but then right. what, why is it become a dead ball and becomes New York City's ball? I, I think that's where <laughs> yeah. where the confuse like I don't know. It very confusing situation. And obviously, um we have many confusing things that we're um discuss on refs later, but you know right. it is what it is. I want to hear your thoughts though. So the the front three, I mean, that was your overall impression, you know, on this game. And I think a lot of people's as well is just this continued trend. You know, we'll, we'll kind of call it that now at this point with how many games we've seen some mishaps or just off connections, lacking of effort at times, um, not by everyone, but just in certain moments, I feel like. Um, but what, what were your other thoughts on that? Yeah, just, you know, past episodes we've said you know there there hasn't been much positive energy coming from them right, right. it feels like that we're, we're kind of bashing them week in week out right um it, it, and there's obvious criticism for it and i think today or today wow saturday <laughs> um they uh they looked like they actually started to have a little you know bright moments here and there and, sure. and you can see it with the goal but the individual play of the players is where they lack the the most um well it's the, it's the individual like spark but it's the collective cohesion right know? like if you <laughs> and there's a difference in, yeah absolutely i mean if you put it in put that shift in you know press high like if that's what you're going to do everyone's got to be committed and if baird's going up to full fledge at the guy and lucho's going full fledged guy but bupenza isn't then it leaves the guy open. So it's all a collective press or it's all a collective effort at what's the plan to build out of the back. I mean, how many times have we said in prior episodes where we just have to relieve pressure and try to play it over the top late on in the game when we get frustrated, our forwards just look to kind of run behind um, instead of kind of interchanging between them because they've been lacking that chemistry. So, I mean, in this game, um, we have 10 total shots and I think we had six on target. It's not like we didn't have opportunities. Like you said, the Fords are at least like creating. Santos goes one-on-one -on -one with the keeper. Bupenza is one-on-one -on -one with the keeper. If they score those, are we talking about this as much? I, I'm not sure. But I, I still think there is things to be figured out. And over the, the week that they had to prepare, you could see some subtleties that were, they were trying to implement. Um, because they actually had training and opportunity to work on those things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I think when, when they're on the ball individually, that's where they're they're not making the decisive yeah decisions. I mean, you 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 saw it with with Bupenza. I mean, he was he had the ball, and he just gets from behind. Some guy just comes up and takes the ball right from him. And he's like he's not he's taking too long and he's not making his choices very quick. I think it also, I think that happened to him twice, honestly. Um, <laughs> Just confidence. Then, I think it's a confidence yeah. thing. Absolutely. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say? I, I would say confidence. And then just, I think he's being too comfortable. You know, I, I think he needs to be quicker. I, 
he just seems to be slow very just a very little off <laughs> yeah just a little off but i mean if you get it all together and with the talent he has and i mean to get him into those spots you know let's say for the one with oriana to make that run for them to have that understanding i mean th- those are impressive things it's to finish it now and that's that's what we need but i mean if you look at our defense i mean this was my overall impression is just again with maybe you know one of your arguably best center backs out you know kip keller fills in and you don't really see much of a press at all you get maybe two chances that i can think of from nycfc that were dangerous um roman now leads the mls in clean sheets with three so to me you know he made the save he needed to but a lot of this is on the defense and just how again impressive they've been but you see you know matt miazga makes team of the match day for a reason because he can command two younger center backs to play against this team and uh you know it's not like nycfc are like world beaters you know they did have some rotation uh, Maxi Morales, you know, one of their better players is out, but we can wake out to consistently do it. And I think to lead the league in goals against now or XG against, you know, I think we're at 0. 0.4 uh, per game, which is top of the league with Toronto. So it's impressive. I mean, what was our weak spot last year? And that is now our strength this year. That's the MLS <laughs> for you. It changes every year. Exactly. Every no, yeah. Year. Defense has been a rock solid this this beginning season i mean our, our depth there we, we were complaining about it at the beginning of the season but we couldn't be more happy let's be honest i think yeah like you said best i i expect them to be the best defense and least goals scored against by the end of the season if all holds you know consistent as we are now yeah i mean in toronto is not going to keep up that pace in my opinion just based on on paper what their defense looks like but um, arguably we're the best, you know, I would say defense in the league, um, you know, experience with Yedlin, Miles Robinson playing at the highest level, playing in, you know, Nations League, Miazga being defender of the year, Murphy kind of stepping up in ways. And then I see Oriano actually improved in this game in some ways too. He wasn't tested as much. They still keep going down his side. They keep attacking at him, but um, he did a lot better at getting back, recovering, maybe having better communication with Murphy too. Um, as we alluded to though, Zach, the, the ref situation was the big kind of talk of the game. You know, you have three VARs in total, um, two of them, in my opinion, that are just clear and obvious mistakes that the ref makes on the field. If that tells you how badly it was being uh, maybe uh, refed in some ways, you know, I, I hate to just be so like critical about it, but the you know main people over the intercom are telling them hey you got this wrong right away right away there's no like uh we'll see you know look look at the replay hey man i think you got this wrong go and look at it you know and that just tells you but how many fouls were there in this game 29 right and two total yellow cards like not taking control of the match in some ways too or taking control of things that didn't even matter for the match where the ball is played on free kicks or set pieces and throw-ins and stuff um it, it was just a wild wild a game and i i thought ours was wild and then i watched some of the columbus highlights i i mean if if you think about it ryan var is is a good thing. I'm glad that they were able to go to VAR, right? I, unfortunately, that they were against us, but... We're going to get it on imagine, the opposite. Yeah. Could you imagine when we don't have VAR, like back right. like a few years ago, you know, those those calls actually standing and then not being able to flip those? Like... Good call. Oof. I mean, I if I was New York City, I would have been livid off of those calls. But yeah, but to your point, you know, uh, throw-ins goal kick corner, you know, the whole thing. Like you could hear the Bailey, like just groan when, when you, you see something across the right. field. You know? yeah. And you, we could even see it clearly. I think there was one where the New York city FC guy headed the ball out and they called it a corner. And I'm, and we're, we're like, we saw it clear as day from all the way across was the, the last state. play of the game, Zach. It was, was that it? No. Yeah. It was uh Yedlin gets stuck in on the guy and it hits off his leg and, you know, we're thinking like, oh, he blows the whistle and he points to the corner and you're like, I mean, what are you getting? Me? Yedlin, I mean, was irate at that point, too. Uh, and that came right after, you know, the VAR situation. So 
again, I mean, let's hope that something gets done with the uh, the replacement refs being hopefully gone soon. Let's get some of the other people back. Um, to your point, like in other games, it could have been us on the other side. So at least we do have some video reviews that can save that potential in the future. Um, just has to be more consistent, in my opinion. Um, and, and I hate to always harp on the ref situation, but it was bad in this game. So, um, Zach, I have a trivia question for you before we go to break here. Lucho has 18 chances created so far this season in 4.0 um, chances per 90 uh, on the year. So what is the record for chances per 90 over the past nine seasons? What is the chance? The record for chances for 90. And as a reference, again, Lucho's at 4.0 right now. Jeez. I'm going to go with... I'm going to go with... Let's go for... Seven. All right. Zach's locking in seven. Uh, wait I think it was that. last year with... with uh, with Lucho again. Do you think it was him? All right. Well, stay tuned to the end of the episode and we'll give you the answer. We'll be right back. Hey, FC Cincinnati fans. We are pumped to share our new sponsor, Peak Cocktails. I'm sipping on the passion fruit margarita, which is so spicy and it makes me feel like I'm on the beach. Ooh, that sounds great. I'm drinking the blood orange spritz, which has a great subtle ginger flavor coming from its scientifically formulated recipe to promote exercise recovery enhance relaxation, and support a better night's sleep. Ryan, that's exactly why I love them. Their cocktails are designed to fit seamlessly into your health-conscious lifestyle, giving you the enjoyment of a delicious adult drink without the downsides of alcohol. Guys, next time you are looking for that post-workout drink or an afternoon pick-me-up, grab a Peak Cocktail. Visit them at www.peakcocktails.com and use the code FLYINLION at checkout to get 20% off your first order. Zach, enjoy your drink. Welcome back, everyone. We are here tonight discussing a good week for FC Cincinnati in, in a lot of ways. Good night um, for uh, the U.S. men's national team last night, too, if anyone was watching the uh, CONCACAF Nations League. So we'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, but yeah, overall, the vibes are good. Um, we're back in first place, Zach, in the MLS. So coming out of this game, we're frustrated in some ways. Could have been a better result, quote unquote, but it's three points at home. I mean, you can't be mad about that win at home. And we finally scored a goal at home, too. So I'm happy about that. It's been some very weird vibes. I'll tell you that, like. Not fun games to watch just because, you know, your attack is what build what gets you points. But like, man, been a rough. It feels rough. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why, but it just does. But then you look at the standings and it's like. We're first in the MLS. We're in the supporter <laughs> shield lead right now. So how mad can we be? You know, um, yeah. I think the expectations are just so much high because of, uh, you know, what we saw last year and the play on the field and the cohesiveness and the chemistry. Um, but it's the, you know, very beginning of the season and you're grinding out results. I mean, we were going back to look at last year's results and 1-0 wins, you know, 0-0, 1-1, 1-0 wins, 2-1, you know, like, just finding ways to win. And like how many times did Lucho come and save us? And that was the reason he was MVP. Um, so he's doing his thing. Well, and you also got to think we were, we were just going through champions cup too. And the fact we True. didn't lose once throughout the whole champions cup, it's pretty impressive. Not going to lie. That's four matches for, that's like a whole month with having Wednesday been weekend match. Like yeah, honorable shout tough. out for the coaching staff for just navigating that. Um, you know, having now Miles out, you know, for a game and Obi, your best center attack or defending uh, midfielder, you know, out for what, two games now. Um, it's just been impressive to find guys that have stepped up in big ways. Now, if we can get the Fords doing that, we'd be unstoppable. <laughs> but again, it's beginning of the season. We're going to get it figured out and we're still in first place. So how mad can we be? Um, Zach, I'm about to find out how mad you are, though, in your card of the week. Yeah, I would probably give this one a red just because of how frustrating I was, frustrating it was. I was frigid on Saturday. I was not prepared at all with the cold weather. The wind was whipping through. Um, 
couldn't imagine what the players wearing the short sleeves were feeling, you know, I, my opinion, if we're going to be, if MLS says that we're going to be playing sooner, you know, February, um, early, I'm pretty much winter still, they need to bring back the long sleeves. A hundred percent. I am demanding it one because they look amazing. And two, because it's cold and, you know, I want to wear a Jersey, but a long sleeve Jersey, you know, to a match, I think that would, uh, make a lot of people happy to be honest. I think more people would probably buy jerseys. I don't know honest. why they haven't made them. I mean, there's no reason to not have a long sleeve jersey. And I'm sure, like you said, the players would love it. Um, I'm sure Lucho would love it. You know, he hates the <laughs> cold. Um, yeah, great point though. I mean, I think every home game has been pretty cold. And this one I was looking earlier on in the week, I'm like, oh well, maybe 50 degrees and then drops down to like, you know, middle 30s with wind chill and you're like all right can we get over this already <laughs> um but yeah i mean at some point it's got to start getting warmer right fingers crossed <laughs> none of these fake spring days that's that right happen. yep exactly but man it bring back the long sleeves ryan what's your card my card of the week, um, so for those who watched uh, the game last night, uh, U.S. played Mexico. They ended up uh, winning um, the uh, CONCACAF Nations League. The Mexican fans towards the end of the game were doing the chant, and I'll just say it's the chant. It was a uh, derogatory, let's say it, uh, slur that they were using, and it stopped the play two different times during the end of the game, um, which is just ridiculous that they even have this – going on because they've set these rules for it they've tried to get rid of this the fans keep doing it it sounds like they were trying to get rid of the people that were actually doing it but there needs to be some sanctions for these fans i mean make it a closed you know uh door game you know for the mexican side for qualifying or something um because otherwise there's going to be no repercussions it's going to continue and it's just like there's no room for this in the game and i think even the players for the Mexican side, we're like, come on, guys. Like, we just want to get through this game and be over with this. And it just kept delaying the game, which was like, all right, the U.S. fans are like, we're going to bask in this. We're winning 2-0, but it's, there's no reason for this. I, I mean, that's it's year after year this happens, and nothing ever happened, comes of it. I mean, sooner or later, CONCACAF has to do something, right? Like, Yeah. I, I feel like with the um, – at least find them or like you're saying, ban them or have it closed door. Right. Ban them, honestly. I mean, let yeah. them not come to any CONCACAF match for the rest of their lives. I mean, you can't that, like, I guess, discriminate like who's a fan of Mexico, who's not, if they're going to games, but if they're having a home game and you do half attendance or something like that, I mean, that diminishes their home field advantage. And at some point, like, you have to go through these protocols of how many times are they going to violate it before they get any repercussions for this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So there's just no reason for this, um, you know, in the game and for any of that that goes on still in world soccer. But on the flip side, Zach, on a brighter note, what was your Jersey swap of the week? The Jersey swap was our good friend, Lucho. I mean, you got to give the man credit, won us the game. In my opinion, MVP of the match, but um, I actually wouldn't well, know. He did make team of the week, didn't he? He was on was, the bench. He was on the bench. No, Miazga was on the bench starting. I was like, you know, <laughs> Lucho won the game for us. I mean, right. he did the he right. did the the show stopping, but you know, I think MVP does great, amazing um, off the ball work that we saw. Um, really drove that offense home, you know. Like we've always been saying, I think he's probably the best number number ten in the um, league. So he's my uh, jersey swap. Two weeks in a row that we've had him in. I mean, I I said him last week. You said him this week. Um, yeah, he's showing up. I think he's catching a little bit into his groove now. Is how I would say it. If you really see if things shake out the way that possibly they could have with VARs, um, you know, could have had two goals and an assist on the night. He ends up, you know, still with a goal in this game. Um, he's just been a special talent for us and there's been no one like him. I mean, what answer do teams have for a guy that can create something out of nothing like that? And that's why he's the MVP. Um, 
chances created, you know, we'll get to it with the, the trivia question, but yeah, I, I think he's done a great job and uh, for him not to lose his temper the rest of the game too on a yellow, you know, is really where I'm going with that is uh, right. impressive. I mean, especially with all the fouls, all the overturned calls and stuff, just as much as, you know, I was going to say with my guy coming up here soon, but Lucho did a good job with that and uh, was able to score and again, get us a win, which he did how many times last year. Um, and now I think, you know, based on the the stat from last podcast, he's up to six game winning goals. So that makes him tied for second in FCC history um, behind, uh, I believe, Barial and Vasquez, as I said last week. So pretty fascinating. If you forwards can't score goals, I'm going to score goals. Exactly. Model. Yep. Yep, exactly. But as I kind of alluded to, my jersey swap of the week was Matt Miazga. Um, like Zach mentioned, he made the uh, team of the match day for the MLS. He had three clearances, which led the game, eight recoveries. Um, so for Kip Keller and you know Ian Murphy that were getting beat or through balls, he kind of was able to get back in those and uh, to recover well. Um, he didn't lose his head with the ref, Zach. That was the biggest thing for me. You know, he didn't get a yellow card in this game with all the craziness that was going on. Um, so props to Matt for that. And just held in, again, a youthful center back line. Um, he's just been awesome to watch over the last two and a half years. Um, we're, we're so lucky to have that talent and his leadership. Like I said, on the field, you can tell a difference when he's out there. I, that's a great point. Him not losing. I didn't even think of that. Him not losing his head like really once. I never really saw him, you know, go up in arms. I mean, maybe just like telling players to go certain like directing and whatnot, right. but maybe he's a little bit nicer to the youthful folk out there, but <laughs> who knows? <laughs> maybe he's giving these refs uh, the benefit of the doubt, you know, that they're coming in and having to fill in. Cause otherwise we, who knows what kind of refs we would have, but um, or maybe he learned his lesson. Maybe he learned something in that uh, disciplinary, you know, film that he had to watch to get his matches, uh, you know, down on his suspension. But who knows? I, I just thought that Matt had a good game. Um, he didn't like do anything like super fancy, but he just does all the right things correctly. Exactly. You know, and that's, that's exactly you what you want. You know, if those guys are making mistakes, you're calling them out and you're saying it because you're seeing it. But if you don't have to say his name and he's winning all the aerial balls and controlling that back line, I mean, that's exactly what we need, especially in this game with Miles out too. Yeah, mad props. Mad, mad props to Miazga. Zach, I wanted to just kind of make a side note. Um, I didn't actually have this on our agenda, but there was a uh, tweet that just came in about an hour ago um, as to a rumor for a U-22 striker. So... Cincinnati has actually put an offer in for a 19 year old center forward, Kevin Kelsey from Shakhtar Dinesh, which is a really good team over in Ukraine um, who plays in the champions league. This guy is a Venezuelan national U 23 player. He's a left footed center forward, but can play on the wing as well. Um, in I think 13 games for them, he's had two goals and one assist. Seems like a pretty good uh, young talent. Again, don't really know a ton about this guy, but um, all signs point to him being a, a pretty solid player if he's breaking through it at Shakhtar at that age of 19. Yeah, no, that's a great point. He's just so young. It could be a U22, you know. Um, I think with, um, with with what I saw, and I think that – I can't remember what the man's name was, but, yeah, he um, – Yeah, shout out Christian Moreres. Yeah, he mentioned that um, – Oh my gosh, where was I going with it? He he didn't have very many minutes. He's not getting many minutes with the right. uh, first team. So I think he's actually open to probably getting more starting minutes, and he certainly would coming to FCC, in my opinion. Yeah, there's a lot of like, is he a second team player, or first team player? I mean, if you're breaking through with Shakhtar at 19, I mean, that's pretty impressive. So um, yeah, we'll see where it goes. Again, we've had a few rumors now, and you know, look out for this space on that. I think there is a lot of opportunity. Uh, we need to find the right person that fits a young, I would say just youthful forward that can go and press and to create opportunities and that can mesh well with, uh, with Lucho, you know, that's what we've, we've been needing early on in the season. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, as we go into 
April, you know, next week. Um, we're getting a little bit closer to uh, April 23rd when this, I guess, first uh, deadline is. Um, or actually, I don't think after that point we can get any transfers uh, until the summer window. So I once think- that closes, yeah, then we we'll have to wait a little while. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if they do anything with that. Um, Zach, as I mentioned earlier on in the podcast, I wanted to touch a little bit on the U S because miles Robinson did get to play, uh, for the U S and again, the CONCACAF nations league. So against all these other CONCACAF teams, they were in the semifinal game against Jamaica. Um, Jamaica was playing without like five of their best players actually. And early on in this game, you know, the U S goes down. I instantly, you know, go and look at a highlight because I missed the first, I think, like 10 or 15 minutes of the game. And I'm like, please don't let it be Miles. Please don't let it be Miles, you know, because he gets the start, Zach. It was unbelievable to see. He was the only MLS guy on the field uh, that started and uh, honestly did pretty well, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, that's great to hear. I Unfortunately, I like I said, I was in Peru, The both matches that they were playing for this final CONCACAF run. But, you know, seeing miles get the, get the cap. I mean, that's, that's important to him. in, in my opinion, I think, you know, Miazga, obviously he, he probably f- feels like he should be in there sure, too. Sure. Um, I think that gives miles a ton of confidence. I know you, w- we've seen in the past, you know, those defenders can get broken down quite often, but um, I think that'll give miles the boost to, um, you know, keep, keep that back line solid. Well, and so what's great about that, I mean, he plays 120 minutes. So uh, 95th minute, there's a corner kick and Pulisic whips it in and Miles just gets anything on it. He gets his head on it, deflects off their defender and goes in. And, you know, then it's a tied game and it's new life for the U.S. So for Miles just to score in that moment, score, if you want to call it own goal, him scoring, whatever. But to have a part in that, um, to send it to overtime, we end up winning 3-1 to go on to play Mexico, you know, yesterday in the final. Um, I I just thought that was cool. And it wasn't anything that he did wrong in that game. He played so well, but it sounds like Greg Berhalter wanted to go with a little bit more experience, a little, I don't even know if it is experience or just like the hotter hand with Tim Ream, but he puts Tim Ream in over miles for the Mexican game. Uh, Maybe a little bit more decisiveness. I thought miles deserved the start for the final, Um, but selfishly as an FC Cincinnati fan, he doesn't play a single minute against Mexico and he's fresh to come back for us, you know? So that's huge. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't come back injured, you know? And that's the thing you worry about for international players. Um, and they end up winning. So like I mentioned, 2 0 win over Mexico, Dosa Cero. Um, it was just cool for him to be a part of that. I'll have to go back and look and see how many MLS guys uh, or even FC Cincinnati guys, I should say, have been a part of like a winning team for the for the national team i can't really think of any off the top of my head oh yeah i mean that's a very good point i mean the fact that um like an active fc player you know for like international competition um i mean yeah i i don't think alvis has ever really i don't know if jamaica's ever yeah won anything while he they've they've qualified for things but i don't know if they've won a trophy no yeah, that's a, that's a good, that might be a good trivia question. Might be a good trivia question coming out. Stay tuned for that one. Um, but yeah, I, overall impressions with that, you know, surviving the international window in some ways. Last year, we'd have like five or six players that would get called in. You'd get three of them back with injuries, and then you'd be kind of filling in the gaps. Miles plays, he does well, he wins this trophy, and he comes back from all that it sounds like healthy, um, which is what we want. So from that, um, now moving on to the next game. Um, Zach, thank you for reminding me for putting this into our agenda because I had forgotten. But we have a game this this coming weekend um, at Charlotte. So uh, we are 2-1-1 one, and one against Charlotte in uh, all matches. So that's four total. Um, they're you know a newer expansion team. They have a new coach, though, um, coming over from England, trying to find their footing a little bit. But um, they're seventh in the table right now. They're two, one, and two. Uh, they always have a huge crowd at home, so I'm really fascinated to see how this one goes. Honestly, I mean, you've got Easter weekend. I think there's going to be a lot of uh, family in town. They're going to want to go see the uh, Charlotte match. I think it's going to be a pretty fun one to watch. I'm not going to lie. I think you're going to see the the stadium pretty full. Unfortunately, not for FC Cincinnati, but 
Um, you know, turf field, I'm curious, uh, are, are we going to see Obi coming back? Are we going to see him play? Or it might be too early to call, but um, I guess we'll see from um, reports through um, training to see if he's actually playing or not. But um, Charlotte's actually going to miss quite a few players. Hmm. Uh, I think there was five or so on their um, injury list at the moment. Um, whether their starters are, are good or not, I, I haven't really dug into that deep enough. But right. um, it, it's it's actually kind of worrisome, you know, with with going into this packed stadium. Charlotte's not been scored against at home yet this this year, so oh, wow. it's, it's like two matches. But um, that's still, I mean, that's pretty impressive um, if you consider that. I mean, same with us, but I don't think Concacaf champions cup counts does it no i'm not gonna call it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean uh what, what kind of lineup do you think we're gonna see ryan i i mean i think you'll see a lot of the same um pat goes with consistency and that's been his thing um in uh, a hostile environment um if i ever get the chance to go to see a charlotte game live i would love to just a really cool atmosphere that they create there um, in a, in a football stadium, you know, on turf, it's a little bit different, but the fans are there and they're rocking, but yeah, you're going to see Yedlin. You're going to see probably miles Robinson, to be honest, Miazga Murphy, probably. Um, I don't think you put Haglin with his hamstring back on turf and have him start. Uh, does Oriano play or do they put Kubo in? I'm not sure. Probably Oriano just cause he's young and still creating moments. But if I remember back to two years ago, Barrial gets his first wing back appearance against Charlotte at Charlotte and just played terribly. So would be very interested to see how he does uh, playing in this game. You know, at least he's had the one game playing in this position um, at least one half against new England, you know, on turf. Uh, so he's had a couple games under his belt now, but um, that, that is immediately what came to mind. And then last year, Barrial scores to tie the game in Charlotte. Um, so he kind of made up for that. So it will be interesting to see that left wing back spot, Oriano. I think that um, I, if I had to put money on it, I think Obi is going to be a sub, but I don't think he's going to start. So you're pretty much going to see a very similar lineup to last week, um, plus Miles Robinson. That's a fair fair assumption. I, I think um, I think the same thing. You, I'd love to see um, who's it. Baird, you know, mm -hmm. switch, you know, do, do you see, I don't, I, I don't know how Charlotte lines up, but I think I'd like to see, may not be the match to try it, but <laughs> to see the, you know, Bupenza sitting up top, you know, with Baird and Lucho, um, right. you know, sitting back behind him a little bit. Do you think we'll go I, with the same, like three setup is what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I just, I have a feeling Pat's going to somehow experiment a little bit, but you know, with it being a, an away match and it's going to be a tough one, I think um, you'll see see comfortability and consistency from the past. Yeah. So maybe not a point. game where they like really like spread the field as much or like get caught up. Like they're they might like play a more solid like back line or not like go up you know what i mean like we're like yedlin maybe tracks back a little bit more this game or maybe you get oriano that uh doesn't go up as high on the field i would love to have that dude just keep dribbling at people though to be honest with you no matter the situation because you don't really have that on the team other than him and lucho obviously too but um oriano just does very well on the ball and just is very good at um tight spaces like when the ball comes to him and the guy's right on his back how does he turn out of that um it only takes one time for that to go wrong you know and to do that in the defensive half and then they're attacking at you with numbers but he's gotten it right so far so i can't blame the guy um in this game zach i think uh my prediction is a, a 1-0 win for us I, I i think it's gonna be tight as well i mean i i was gonna say 1-0 but I think it might be a uh, two one match. I think we're gonna somehow pull out too. You think so? Yeah. Okay. Get yeah. the get the forwards actually uh, scoring some goals. Hopefully. Yeah, I, I think I think it'll be a more Santos sub goal, but <laughs> maybe okay. a Boop and Santos. Boop and Santos. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. 
Yeah. yeah, I'm excited to see how the rest of this week's goes uh, in terms of, you know, seeing, like we said, is Obi available or not? Um, having him back out there, I mean, is just for consistency, for, you know, demanding, you know, the rest of the guys around him to play tight knit in the midfield. Sometimes I feel like uh, you mentioned earlier on in the podcast with Kubo and Buka, both like technically attacking style players in some ways you need some guys to stay back in the midfield because Lucho hasn't, you know, that's not really his job, but you need Kubo to kind of stay around that area. Um, But he's been playing a ton of minutes. I mentioned it on the last podcast is at some point, this guy has got to get a rest. Um, So do you see Pinto at, at some point rotate in for more minutes and have Kubo sub in, and then you can put him wherever you need him. Like we've been saying. That's a good point. Super sub him. Yeah. I mean, can you get 45 minutes out of Pinto um, like we did in New England? I don't know. It's an interesting thought. That That is a good thought to ponder for the rest of the week. I'm good <laughs> yep. So uh, before we end here, Zach, I want to give you our, our trivia question again, and we'll give you the answer. So Lucho has 18 chances created so far this season and 4.0 or four chances per 90 this year. What is the record for chances per 90 over the last nine seasons? I think you locked in, was it seven? Yeah. So the top was actually in 2021. Carlos Gil had 5.1 oh. um, chances created per 90, which was the best in the last nine seasons, which I just thought was fascinating. Lucho in his MVP season topped the league, but was 3.2. Wow. So Carlos Hill had an unbelievable 2021. And yeah, I think that's when they won the supporter shield. Supporter shield, yeah. But even with him being MVP last year, uh, 3.2, I mean, that's pretty dang good per game. He's yeah. at 4.0 or four, you know, chances, really good chances per game for us, which I think is like top three in the last nine seasons. So if he can keep that clip up, we've been heavily relying on him, but he's been doing it. And that that kind of blows my mind. Five five point one. That's a pretty high stat. Yeah, tough to beat. But yeah, I, I don't see why how Lucho couldn't do it. Yep, absolutely. If there's gonna be a person, it's gonna be him. So, Zach, any final uh, thoughts before we close out? No, I just uh, hope everyone has a good Easter. Sounds good, man. Yeah, everyone have a great Easter. We will see you next week, hopefully with a win in Charlotte. See you next week. Mm-hmm.